Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and this is Warhammer Underworlds Online. Now, this is the closed beta for December. However, it is the first beta test for the game which does not have a non-disclosure agreement attached. Meaning, I can show you anything and everything I like. And I probably will. There's about four or five days left before the test closes and I fiddle around a bit, poked a bit and the game is coming out into early access at the very back end of January. I believe it's the 28th but don't quote me on that. There will be a January closed beta test as well which I'm going to try and get in on. I don't know if I get on it automatically for having been on this one. If not, hey, I'll get in at the end of the month anyway when I buy early access. So, let's get one really important thing out of the world, out of the way first. I'm going to keep calling this Shade Spire all the time, constantly. You see, originally, when the first Warhammer Underworlds box came out, it had, you know, the words Warhammer Underworlds in very small letters and then Shade Spire in big letters across the top of the box. And we had the beautiful story in the box as well about the city of Shade Spire and how it all comes together and makes sense. And we all just called it Shade Spire because that's what it was. And then next year, Games Workshop came out with Warhammer Underworlds Night Vault. And we thought, oh, we're all supposed to stop calling it Shade Spire, but it is Shade Spire just with slightly updated rules and different gangs and stuff. And then of course we have uh, Beast Grape this year. So yes, I, I'm relatively familiar with how the game plays from a tabletop perspective. And this is indeed an adaptation of a tabletop board game. However, it's also a very faithful adaptation and I like it a lot. Just getting that out of the way, you know, yeah, okay, so I'm biased apparently. Uh, don't worry, no one's paying me to advertise this or anything, I'm just showing off something that I'm enjoying. And of course, those of you who might not be familiar with my videos, will understand. it's probably best to tell you, I like to have a little talk about the game before I get started on the first episode. After that, I'm like jumping straight in. So, Shadespire is a ruined, abandoned city made of magical shade glass. The city was once erected by Nagash, Lord of the Dead, who now is no longer here, but all the powerful spells and sorceries he wove into the city linger on like half-forgotten ghosts. Who knows if he recalls half of the effort and energy and thought he put into creating this place. Now though, Small bands of individuals, for their own reasons, which do differ significantly, venture into the city, some seeking treasure, others glory, and others for even more sinister or personal motives. Very few return, and those that venture into the city after them, seeking their long-lost comrades, find not a single sign of them, except perhaps for a reflected face within the glass. A familiar silhouette that fades from view after a while, or the echo of a voice once so familiar. Within the glass, the captured individuals fight on. They do not know they have been captured, they do not know they may have perished. They fight and die and fight again. And these are the war bands we play in this game. Currently there are only four factions in the beta, which is quite impressive. The game is likely to launch with less, it may only launch with two or four factions. It will launch with an even number, I can tell you that. There are eight factions in Season 1, and currently everything in the game is Season 1. 
So, our four factions are... Steelheart's Champions. These are... Sigmarines. That is to say... Warriors of the Great Sigmar, the Stormcast Eternals. Glorious, heroic individuals. No, they're not. They're Sigmarines. Everyone knows Sigmarines are evil, stupid, and wrong. Apart from people who don't understand what Sigmarines are. Sigmarines are really bad and horrible. They ruined Warhammer Fantasy. I don't like Sigmarines. But they think they're good and their enemies think they're good, so maybe they are a little bit good somehow, even if they are deluded. Then we have Magor's Fiends. A group of... Chaos Warriors worshipping the god Korn. The Lord of Slaughter, the Blood God, and they even have a flesh hound of corn at their beck and call. Now, this is interesting because in the initial Shadespire starter box, we had Steelheart's Champions and we had a different corn warband of Chaos Fugs, Marauders, not so heavily armoured. There was more of them, I believe there were five, but they are not currently implemented in this version of the game. Then we have Iron Skull's boys. These are orcs. They're orcs of the Bad Moon Clan, as you can tell by their yellow armor. They're big, they're brutal, they mean serious business. And then we have the Sepulchral Guard, a group of skeletal remnants who rise up from the ruins of the city to fight on. Each of these factions has a distinct but not too distinct playstyle. Now, when you select a faction, this is what you get. You get the models, you get the gang, these are the guys you're going to play with. If you take Steelheart's Champions, it's going to be these three individuals. Magor's Fiends, these four. Iron Skull's Boys, these four. And the Sepulchral Guard, seven skeletons. Some warbands actually got to eight or nine. Your average warband size is around four or five models. A free model warband is quite tough and sturdy, whereas a six or seven model warband tends to be on the flimsy side. Now, you play with a preset force and you cannot customize your warband. If I take Steelheart's Champions, I get uh, Steelheart, Oberon, and Angharad. Yes, it's Angharad, it's a Welsh name, it's lovely and beautiful. It rolls off the tongue, wonderfully so. Ever more familiar and easy if you're very familiar with the Mabinogion, but anyway. Right. So you cannot customize your gang, you can't change what equipment they have, you can't change what their stats are. What you can change is your cards. This is a deck building game. You will have a deck of cards that are used throughout the game and you customize the cards. So, I can't change the fact he has a two-handed hammer, I can't change the fact he has a two-handed sword, the fact that she has a hammer and shield, but I can have cards that will make his hammer hit a bit heavier, knock people back, beat them about, make his sword chop through armor, make her be able to bash people back with her shield if they get too close. You know, things that make the game more interesting. So the cards are how you customize your faction. And with that, I'm going to dive into the current tutorials in this build. Now this is a, a test build and we do have a bug reporting button up here. So if I encounter any bugs, I am you know duty bound to report them unless I've reported them already previously, I think. Let's hope that doesn't happen in the tutorials, although I did spot one bug in a tutorial previously. Uh, online play, play against another human. I'm probably not going to do that in the first one or two of these videos in this little series, because I have plenty of experience playing the game against humans in real life, and this is more showing off the game for you guys to get you excited and go, Oh wow, Raph, that's coming out in like six weeks. Mega, we're all going to buy it and play it with you and be your friends forever. No, you're not. I know, but you, you play it with each other, you know. Uh, bot match, play against bots, and tutorials. Tutorials are fine for now. Let's go for that. Now, depending on the length of the tutorial, because I've having played it myself personally, 
I haven't recorded it previously, so when I get to the end of the first tutorial, I will look at the episode length and decide if I've got time to record the separate one, the second one, all in the one video, or if I'll record that as a second video, and then I'll follow that with at least one bot match, quite possibly one bot match for each faction, depending on how many I'm able to get in before time runs out and the files fade from my Steam account and are gone, and I have to wait until next month to try and get into the next beta test. So, let's skip straight into this basic tutorial. And yes, it is basic, but it's actually really nicely done as a tutorial. Uh, just give me a moment, I'm going to check my audio levels. Uh, hopefully my voice isn't being drowned out by the game too much. I can adjust the game's audio levels which default to actually being turned all the way down and silent. But I turned them up a bit so I could hear the game. Looks okay. Uh, I'm just going to pause recording briefly and check. And we're back. I've turned down the volumes a, a smidgen because those who are hard of hearing might have had difficulty hearing my voice over the backing audio. Hopefully it's all still fun, and we can all enjoy this together. Right, on to the basic tutorial. I'm likely to provide commentary on the tutorial as I go, based on my experience, so loading things up. So, this is an arena-based game, played in matches. Traditionally, it's played in a best of three matches where you play the same opponent three times with the same gang, same deck of cards, and then see who wins the most of those matches. It's played on a hex board. Let's have some fun. So, this is the basic tutorial. This tutorial will teach you how to play Warhammer Underworlds online. Click and drag to move the camera. You can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out and so go left and right. For, that's backwards, that's forwards. So the forwards and backwards is inverted, so it's like dragging. It's not panning the camera, it's dragging the board around. Uh, it's mouse wheel to zoom in, mouse wheel to zoom out. There we go. Can't zoom out. Well, can zoom out a reasonable amount, actually. So here we have the ruined shade glass city. Separated from her stormcast brethren, Angharad Brightshield finds herself alone in the mirrored city of Shade Spire. But Angharad is not alone for long. Blood warriors Zarkus and Gartok come stalking out of the shadows. Here we have a fighter stack card. Um, the hexagon indicates how far she can move. The shield or dodge icon indicates how many dice she rolls for defense and which symbols will be successful and wounds, how much damage she can take before she's taken out of action. Each turn you activate one of your fighters as you seek glory and triumph in Shadespire. Your fighters have three main characteristics. The number of hexes your fighter can move in each activation. Uh, can I, I can't go that... there we go. That's a bit easier to read, isn't it? The number of dice your fighter rolls when defending against an attack. And wounds are the total damage they can endure before they are taken out of action. Angharad is never one to shy away from a fight. She immediately immediately charges towards the nearest servant of corn. Select Angharad. Select her Sigmarite hammer attack. Click on Zarkus to confirm the charge action. And here we go. So, I've rolled two hammers and a daggers or swords, depending on what you want to call it. Uh, her hammer needs hammers to strike. I can't pull up the card right now because it was it's out of the way because of the tutorial. But yes, so weapon attack profiles also display if they need hammers or daggers for success. When a fighter attacks, they roll a number of attack dice equal to the dice characteristic of the attack. Angharad is rolling three attack dice. Her attack needs to roll smash hammer symbols succeed. Now, 
the beauty of this is that they have started calling the hammers smash and the daggers wrath but they didn't start doing that until the game had been out for a year or two already so we just all called them daggers and hammers because it's what they were when attacked fighters will roll a number of dice equal to their defense characteristic our opponent has rolled one shield successes cancel out Zarkus is rolling one defense die Die is singular, dice are plural. I know Games Workshop have been making this mistake since the 80s, but you'd think they would have learnt by now. But the, the problem with, with treating dice as singular is you get people saying dices as a plural, and that's just wrong. Now, the main reason is this because, you know, dice games in the past, up until quite recently, like board games like Ludo and stuff, you know, uh, you'd never roll a single die, you'd always roll two dice, or more. So Zarkus is rolling one defence die. He is looking for a block, which is a shield, result to help successfully defend. We have two hammers, he has one shield, his shield counts out on one hammer. If the attacker rolls more successes from the defender... Sorry, I, I, I just had uh, <laughs> images of mental images of Carol Vorderman on countdown so, say, saying more successes in the same way she used to say which lowers cholesterol if the attacker rolls more successes than the defender the attack succeeds and the defender takes damage and Harrod's two hammers beat Zarkus's single shield so Zarkus takes two damage as we see two of his wound symbols above his head have darkened from a shimmery bronzy off bronze colour to a dull ruddy bloodstained red. If an attack is a success or a draw the attacker can choose to drive back the defender which I think we very much want to do. Choose a drive back position for Zarkus. I'm going to send him to this hex here. And Harad's Sigmarite hammer lands with a force so mighty the blooded warrior staggers backwards. And he's certainly reeling there from the impact. Sensing an opportunity, Gartok charges in to attack the surprisingly aggressive Stormcast. So that's a hammer and a symbol I'll explain later. Because it'll come up eventually. An attack will fail if there are no successes in the attack roll, or if there are an equal or more amount of successes in the defense roll. This symbol is only a success with assistance. He's on his own, so the hammer could be a success. Fortunately, Angharad's one shield is enough to stop Gartok's one hammer attack. So she parries the attack, but he still gets to drive her back. Angharad brings up her shield in time to block Gartok's furious attack. Despite reeling from the blow, she more, she's more determined than ever. And the reason we drove Zarkas back to be there instead of here is we didn't want him to being next to Gartok. However, he's still relatively close. In certain circumstances, your fighters can become inspired, improving their stats and abilities. Angharad and the rest of Steelheart's champions become inspired whenever they roll a shield or a critical success while defending an attack. Now, when a character becomes inspired, their base profile improves. When playing the game physically, you flip the card over to reveal the inspired side, which is better. Emerging from the fog is Severin Steelheart, the leader of Steelheart's champions. With stoic determination, he strides towards the cries of battle. Since Angharad has a charge token, she is unable to move or attack for the rest of the round. Instead, we will move Severin closer to the action. If a character moves, they gain a move token. If they charge, they gain a charge token. A character who has moved cannot move again until the end of the round. A character who has a charge token cannot take any further actions for the rest of the round. So essentially a charge token is like a move token plus. 
it's actually often the same token just flipped over to the other side. So we select Severin, we select the destination hex within his movement range, there we go, and then we click the move button down here to move him to the location. Now hopefully, if Zarkus charges to here, we will be able to assist in Angharad's defense. Ignoring his wounds, Zarkus whips his head around to the armor-clad newcomer. He charges forwards with bloodshot eyes and a crazed scream. Ah! He has wisely avoided that hex. Critical success! If a defender rolls more critical successes than their attacker, the defender automatically blocks the attack action regardless of the number of successes in the attack roll. So, a critical success blocks all of the successes the opponent has apart from criticals. Criticals cancel out, then you go to normal successes. So if Zarkas had rolled one critical and one hammer, our criticals would have cancelled out and then his hammer would have gone through. You can roll criticals for both attack and defense, by the way. Zarkas rolls two hammers, but Severin's single critical success allowed him to defend against the attack. And that, seeing the card flip over there, means he is also inspired. Since Severin has a move token, he is unable to move or charge for the rest of the round. However, he can still attack which we would like to do. So we select Severin, we select his Sigmarite broadsword. Now, the symbol is a hammer. So attacks have three things on their profile. They have a range, which is the distance at which you can strike a foe, the number of dice you roll, and the symbol required for success. Remember, a critical is always a success. So we would be rolling two dice needing hammers, and damage is the amount of damage dealt if the attack goes through. Oh, that is brutal. Remember what I was saying about if we'd each rolled one critical, but the attacker had rolled one more hammer? <laughs> because Severin and Zarkas rolled a critical success... Sorry, both Severin and Zarkas rolled a critical success, so they will cancel each other out. However, Severin also rolled an additional hammer. This attack will succeed. Severin brings down his Sigmarite broadsword on Zarkus, and the Blood Warrior crumbles beneath the might of the Stormcast. Once a fighter has been dealt damage equal to their wounds characteristic, they are taken out of action. The player who took the fighter out of action will gain the glory point. Will gain a glory point. And as any of you who've watched any old game shows will know, points mean prizes. This, down here, is a glory point. It can be gained via various ways during a match. Whichever side has the most glory points at the end of a match is declared the winner. Yes, this game is not about killing your enemy. It's about scoring glory points. And whoever can accumulate the most glory by the end of a match wins. Now, let's be fair. Killing your enemy's warband makes it a lot harder for them to achieve glory but it's not your primary objective. And he crumbles and falls to pieces. I kind of wish he'd fade and, and drift off like an illusory uh, shadowy form. But I suppose they could also be considered to be made of the shade glass. Drawn by the smell of slaughter, Riptooth the Fleshhound leaps in from the shadows. Oh, here he comes. Following in the footsteps of his leader, Oberyn the Bold steps onto the battlefield. We shall move him, and as it's a tutorial, we are instructed to move him here. Wherever Riptooth, <laughs> wherever Riptooth is, Magor Red Hand is never too far away. The leader of the fiends vows to drown this battlefield in blood, and he probably will. He's pretty dangerous. 
Now, this is the end of round one. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Each side gets four activations before a round ends. When the round ends, all charge and move tokens are removed from the board. In physical play, the fighter's reference cards would be around the edge of the board. Tokens on reference cards do not go away. Tokens on the board do go away. This means fighters can charge, move and attack again until next round. Round 2. FIGHT! Starting a new round, roll off. At the start of a new round, each player rolls four dice to determine who goes first. The player who scores the highest number of critical successes wins and gets to choose which player goes first. There is a backup thing for, for dealing with ties. There are tiebreaker conditions. If both players are tied for the most critical successes, or no player has rolled any, then the player for most single supports wins. If players are still tied, then the player winner is the player for most double supports. Now, I'm just putting these over here so you can see them a bit better. Single support and double support matter in combat. If you have an ally adjacent to the target, then you get single support success. If you have two allies adjacent to the target, you get double support success. Now, you'd think double support is better because it's fuller, it's the complete symbol, whereas single support is like half the symbol. But single support is better because it only requires one ally, whereas double support is weaker because it requires two. The way to remember this is to look at the dot in the middle of the symbol and see if it's got one bracket or two brackets around it and imagine the brackets as your allies providing support. So I'm seeing a single and a double and I'm seeing a crit, a single and a double. You won the roll off so you'll get to go first. Severin can see the forces of Korn closing in. He prepares for the onslaught. Oh goody. This is the guard action. A unit on guard will succeed on defense rolls when rolling both block and dodge results. This is really helpful. So we select Severin and we will give him the guard action. This now gives him a guard token for the rest of the round unless he charges. He will successfully defend on both blocks and dodges. Gartok seeks to succeed where Zarkus failed and launches himself at Severin for the glory of Korn! And now we're going to get a single assist because of Angharad. Not that we rolled one. If you have a friendly fighter adjacent to an attacker, they can give support to your defense rolls. Results of single support will count as successes. If you have two allies adjacent, then double support will also count. So yes, your single support is here. We have a dodge and a single support. Person dot in the middle, one support, two support around the other side, and he has two support, but no supporters to actually convert back two support to a success, and a hammer. I think we're okay. Thanks to being on guard and Angharad's support, Severin rolls, Severin's rolls of dodge and single support both count as successes and he is able to easily defend against Gartos' attack. It, my bad, I forgot that defense dice are always grey and thought that these were the attack dice and mine dice were over here defending for some reason. Support can also work for attacks. For example, Angharad will get support from Severin if she attacks Gartok, and likewise Severin will get support from Angharad. Any single supports will result any single support results on her attack will be counted as success. So let's do that. Let's batter him with a hammer. Also, I wish my dice would roll this well. <laughs> With support from Steelheart, Angharad manages to land a solid blow on Gartok. So he got a success with his shield, but we had a hammer and a single support. Doesn't matter which one it cancels out, we still got one more success than he did. And a common mistake a lot of beginning Shade Spires will make is multiplying their damage value by the amount of successes they got through. It's not successes per successful die, it's just 
it, it's not a matter of damage per successful dive it gets through its amount of damage for the attack full stop with support from Steelheart Angharad manages to land a solid blow on Gartok some fighters have special abilities such as Gartok who can never be driven back by an attack even if it succeeds Without warning, Riptooth rushes forward to take a bite out of Oberyn. However, Severin will be providing assistance, but that ain't gonna help. And he is driven back. Be warned, Magor and all his fighters inspire when they inflict damage! So now Riptooth is inspired. Surrounded by servants of Khorn would normally be a dire position to be in, but Severin sees an opportunity to turn the tide. Oh, he could charge me. No, no. Ooh, tricky, tricky, tricky. Some attacks have the scything ability, which allows an attack to strike all adjacent enemy fighters. Remember, the tutorial is set up to show you virtually almost everything you need to know to play. So we select Severin. We select his mighty swing which will attack all adjacent enemies and we could click on either of these we get this nice circular icon showing us if it's going to swing around and attack all the enemies and they want us to start on Riptooth. Mighty Swing targets all adjacent enemies so select which which adjacent fighter targets guard at first yeah 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 that's fine and it will be rolled separately for each of them so that's a hammer and a single assist and two dodges. I think Riptooth's okay. And then for Gartok, a hammer and a single assist. We have a single assist. However, Riptooth is adjacent to the attacker, so a single assist would also work for defense there. Gartok is slain. With a bloodthirsty roar, Magor charges directly at the leader of Steelheart's champions. And he's got assistance. He's got a single assist, not a double assist. And we got two shields, so we're okay. Ooh. Uh, what? Oh, yes, cleave. Of course, I didn't know Mago had cleave. That makes a lot of sense. Some attacks have the cleave ability, which allows them to ignore any block results the defender rolls. Which, unfortunately, is why Severin is taking damage. Yeah. Cleave ignores shields. There's also an ability that ignores dodges. I believe it's called ensnare. But I don't believe it comes up during the tutorial. While his leader reels from Magor's attack, Oberyn instead charges silently and deliberately at Riptooth. Some attacks have the knockback ability, which allows them to drive an enemy back an additional hex from a successful attack. That's a bloody big hammer. So we select Oberyn, we select Sigmarite Grand Hammer, and we select Riptooth. Now, with long knockbacks you have to go back in a straight line, you can't choose odd directions. Uh, sending him back here would be too close to Magor, sending him back here, I I'm thinking about support and if we want to charge around and fight from angle, so we knock him back that way. Now this could actually be where I found a bug because there's a bug later, there's a place where you knock someone back over here in one of the tutorials and it talks about them being on an objective and they're not. We don't even have objectives this tutorial, okay that's fine. Of four servants of Khorne, only Magor and Riptooth remain, but they are currently too spent to launch an assault. Each of these has a charge token so they literally can't do anything else this round. There are other actions in a normal game that could be done, but hey. If you find all your fighters have a charge token or are unable to make an attack, you may have to skip your turn and wait until the next round, which would be coming up next, except... Victory! Player Nothing wins by a glory total of 2 to nil. We have completed the first tutorial, and you know what, I think that we'll just try and squeeze the second one in anyway. Uh, so now we're going, that was just pure basics, now we're going on to the, the card mechanics and the glory of the game. That is the way that the game is played, as it were. 
and hopefully this is giving you a, a somewhat understanding of how the game's played if you're not entirely familiar with it. And if you are familiar with it, hey, hope you enjoy the tutorials anyway, there will be better gameplay videos coming sometime soon in the next few days. The battle lines are drawn as Steelheart's champions prepare to defend themselves against the bloodthirsty Magor's fiends, but there's something strange. Has this happened before? Yes it has. They are reflections fighting in the glass forever and ever. The ba <clears throat> Objective cards. These cards, down here, will help you earn glory if you can achieve their conditions, usually by the end of the round. Objective cards are your primary method for gaining glory. And we can mouse over them here, and we get nice little card text pop-up information. These cards over here, so objective cards, power cards. So you have two decks of cards. You have one object you have an objective deck of twelve cards and a power deck of twenty or more cards. I don't know if this twenty-two cards is roughly the sweet spot for a power card deck. Twenty-four cards and it starts getting too unreliable and just too difficult to get the cards you need often enough. I don't know if this game will allow us to play above a 20 card power deck. These cards are played in between player activations and can be used to help turn the tide of battle in your favour. Some can even be played during activations. I didn't even get to see one for Roloff. A sizeable expanse separates the two- way whoa whoa whoa! So there are five objective markers on the battlefield. You can earn glory at the end of your round if you have an objective card that matches one of the objective markers your fighters are standing on. I, I didn't skip that, I don't know why that whooshed past like that. Suddenly Riptooth sidles up to Magor. After an activation, players can take turns starting with the current player, that would be Magor's Fiends, to play power cards to affect the battle. We're going to push Angharad onto an objective marker. Select and drag sidestep from your power hand onto the playing area to use it. So just drag it out. Now select Angharad, there we go. And push her onto the objective marker. Shunk. Now that didn't give her a move token, it wasn't activation, it was just a ploy card. Passing the power step. When you don't have any more power cards that you want to play, you can click pass to go to the next activation. We pass the power step, and it goes to our activation. Uh, discard and draw objective cards. Instead of activating a fighter on your turn, you can discard an objective card you don't think you'll score and try to draw a better one. Select and drag the discard and draw objective cards from your objective hand onto the play area to do this. There we go. Objective 4 is too far away. Objective 4 is all the way over there. We're not getting on that this round. So yes, discard this objective now by dragging it onto the play area. There we go. We now have hold objective 5 as a replacement, which is just over there. We also have, if none of our fighters suffered any damage, and if we're holding objective one, which is this one. So we got a point of glory at the end of the round unless she gets shunted off there anyway. Pass for power step to continue. Here we go. Riptooth leads, leaves Magor's side to ready themselves within striking distance. So he's setting up for round two, or he's, he's on an objective that we want. In your next activation, Blood Slick Ground has been played, which means your fighter's movement will be reduced during your next activation. You won't be able to charge the enemy, but you will have other options. Yes, we will. Pass the power step to continue. Draw power cards. Instead of activating a fighter, you can draw a power card and looking for something that could possibly draw a power card and looking for something 
that, that and word is redundant. You can draw a power card looking for something that could possibly give you an edge in a future turn. Now, we don't need to discard a power card to draw a power card, but our power card hand size is five cards. At the end of the round, if we have more than five, we must discard down to five. So we drag this card up here, just as we did for the um, changing a objective card. Peel of Thunder will be useful, but we'll hold on to it for now. Choose an enemy fighter and push from one hex in any direction. Yes, that will be very useful. Pass for power step to continue. Okay, so we're not doing it just yet. Oh, we're not doing... No, we're not going to push him off because then he could go stand on it with someone else. Impatient to get to the fight, Gartok runs over there and apparently the tooltip disappears too quickly for me to read it. You can play multiple power cards on the same power step to great effect. However, players alternate playing to power cards, so we would play one, then they would play one. We are going to use Peel of Ripped Thunder to push Riptooth off objective marker 5. Last time I played this tutorial, Riptooth wasn't standing on objective marker 5. Oh no, no, that's it. We use Peel of Thunder to push him off it. Then we use an attack to run up and knock him off the objective, but he's not standing on it anymore. That, I think, is the bug. So there we go. We've played the card, we select the target, and push him back to there. Oberyn can now move and hold objective 5, but we're not going to stop there. We're also going to attempt to take Riptooth in one hit. Play Righteous Zeal. This card will give your first attack and the next activation plus one damage. And now we're going to pass for power step. Our opponent has had the opportunities to pass play cards in between ours. Uh, usually the power step is initiated by the question, any cards? Asked of the opponent. Now is the time to strike. Select Oberyn and charge onto objective marker 5 and take out Riptooth. We will do our best. There's Oberyn. There's his charge attack. Righteous zeal effect. Good to know. And we're going straight for Riptooth. That's a hammer and a critical against a single shield, and Riptooth uses dodges. Riptooth is down. Good blow. Well struck. We also gained one glory for a kill. Kills grant one glory. Power cards. Upgrades. Upgrades are power cards that can be attached to your fighters to improve their stats, attacks, or give them new abilities. To equip an upgrade, you must spend glory you have earned. Don't worry, spent glories will still count towards your overall score at the end of a battle. Yes, so your total glory gained during the battle is what you're scoring on. Glory that you spent just means you can't spend it twice. Let's equip Severin with great speed by dragging it into the play area. This will allow him to move further and strike back at the encroaching servants of corn. Encroaching is a great word, it should get used more often. Now select Severin to equip him with the upgrade. There we go. And that power has now gone grey. We will pass for power step now as instructed. With little concern for his own safety, Zarkus advances forwards, hoping to be the that's too fast. That's three objective markers held by corn. We cannot let that stand, especially as there is actually an objective card which scores you free glory for holding three different objectives at the end of the round. And if our opponent has that, we're in trouble. Uh, we are going to apparently pass the power step. We got, we got no glory to play upgrades. Those are both upgrade cards. Oh, final activation of the turn. Severin can now move much further, so rush up and attack Zerk. Zarkus and drive him back. Back with you, vile fiend! And... <laughs> Taking advantage of Zarkus' recklessness, Severin dashes forth and brings his blade to bear on the blood warrior, damaging him and forcing him back. 
We will send him towards Obrin. Also, Angharad can run and get him. So now we've passed the power step, and we should be at the end of the round. During the end phase, each player scores glory for whatever objectives they have achieved. The player who went first at the start of the round scores first. So our opponent must have gone first. Yes, we had the last activation, so our opponent went first. Magor's fiends have managed to score two glory for holding objectives two and four. Magor is using his newly earned glory to equip his fighters for the next round. You managed to score all your objectives. You have scored objectives one and five and did not take a point of damage last round. So, we drag them all up to score them. After scoring objectives, you can spend some of your new glory equipping any upgrades still in your power hand. Select and drag Great Fortitude for player and click Oberon to equip it because he is out there and pretty exposed. Some upgrades can only be equipped to certain fighters. For example, Lightning Blade can only be equipped on Severin, which we're apparently going to do right now. Now, an annoying factor of this computer version of the game is that when there's only one person a card can be played on, we still have to click on them to say, yes, this is the person we want to play this card on. You now get to draw back up to five power cards and three more objective cards ready for the start of round two. We now have three new objectives and five power. Now, normally if it wasn't a tutorial, I would spend time, a little time, studying my objective cards to work out how best I'm going to achieve them. Uh, we've got a single and a double, they got two singles and a double, the opponent goes first. Gartok wants nothing but to spill blood for Kalorn! He charges directly at Severin and delivers a savage blow with a critical hit that's gonna hurt. Oh, that's really bad. And something's happened. Oh, he's drinking a healing potion. Uh, Zarkus. Gartok activated, but Zarkus can still drink the healing potion, right? Use the healing potion card and target Severin. How wonderful! We had a healing potion too. Ah, uh, so there is a dice roll for healing potion, which we have failed, so we only get one point of healing. The healing potion is not as effective as we'd hoped, but we'll just solder on. Pass for power step. Lightning Blade has a range characteristic of two, allowing Severin to attack Gartok without needing to move or charge. However, more importantly, he might be able to do his whirlwind attack on both of them as well. As they are both within... Is it... it okay. Lightning Blade has not upgraded his attacks. It is a separate attack. So, we're going to try and hit Gartok now, apparently. Essentially, there's lightning tendrils coming off the edge of his sword, which are reaching out further and hitting for him. Some power cards are reactions and cannot be played normally in the power step. Instead, they trigger automatically in response to specific conditions. Reaction cards are awesome, especially if you're a chosen Axis player and you have READY FOR ACTION! Possibly the most powerful card in the game and sadly, no longer tournament legal as of Season 3. But yeah, had to buy the dwarfs to get it. So yeah, we're going to play Tireless Assault now. Play this after a friendly fighter's attack action that fails. The fighter can make another attack action that targets the same fighter. We shall do so. Uh, so it must be Lightning Blade once again. Do we pl pull that up or do we put it onto his hex? On his hex, quite possibly. Oh, that's looking good. Oh, yes. Whack! And now we end the power step. Even though that wasn't a power step, that was a... Technically, that was a uh, reaction. 
So Magor's just rushed in here. We didn't even get any descriptive text. Uh, hammer and a dagger to our one shield, but he can knock us back. Uh, passing the power step. Some objectives can be scored midway through a round, instead of waiting for the end phase. Let's use Angharad to try and score lightning strikes during this activation. Score this immediately. Score this immediately cards are lovely. If an enemy fighter is taken out of action by a charge action made by one of your fighters. Uh, okay, I think it should be going for Gartok here. Yes, indeed. Hammer attack. Gartok. Here we go. Oh, beautiful. A hammer and a critical. He is down for the count. And we are ridiculously high on glory now. Oh, I like the fact that when I mouse over it, it actually splits it into the spent and unspent. Fountain of Gore. When you score a surge objective, you get to immediately draw another objective to replace it, just as if you had discarded an objective. So, apart from the end phase, you always have three objectives in your, can, in your hand. Let's put that glory to use and equip Oberyn with Brave Strike. Uh... Roll an extra die for no adjacent friendly fighters. Ah! So if he has no support, he hits even harder. Well, powers through enemy's defense. And we put it on Oberon because he's the only one who can have that upgrade. And now we're apparently going to pass for power step. It seems the Blood Warriors are determined to hold on to this point, with Zarkus leaping over the fallen Gartok to viciously strike at Angharad. I think he's going on to objective free then. Oh, he is. That means they've probably got an objective free objective card. Two hammers to the one shield means she is taking damage, but she is at least inspired. No escape. The fiends score their own surge objective. No escape by charging with three of their fighters this round. Even if they're dead, it still counts. Uh, surge objective is a score this immediately objective. The only way to deal with a follower of corn is to smite them down, and Severin will attempt to do just that. More importantly, we've got to get him off that objective. So we're going to select Severin. We are going to do a regular Sigmarite broadsword attack for some reason. Why is that? More damage. We're going for the kill. Got it. And we're coming in from that angle. Normally we could control this a bit, but that angle's just fine. Oh, that is rubbish. That is a completely unsuccessful attack. Some fighters have special abilities that let them automatically take a reaction, just like having a reaction card down here. Oh, Zarkus has a counter-attack. That's really nasty. But our leader is inspired. Did he just swell and grow bigger when he got inspired? Zarkus gets to use his gore fist to counter-attack any enemy that misses an attack against him. So, essentially, he shouldn't have made a big choppy action with his axe. He should have just punched him with an armoured gauntlet. Luckily for Severin, his counter-attack misses. Uh, it's like the leader of the Orcs has a headbutt attack upgrade card he can be given but he doesn't have a special headbutt animation for it probably because that card might not even be in his deck and he just uses the same normal attack as he would with his weapons it's a very confusing headbutt this presents us with an opportunity if we can smite the corn warrior we can at least dislodge him from that objective select and drag confusion into the play area to swap the positions of Severin and Zarkus ah. Yes, select Severin, select Zarkus. We might have been able to select from both the other way around. And we're now going to pass the power step. We're running low on power cards. Again, all of the corn warriors are temporarily spent and they get to pass for activation or draw cards. And we're going to pass for power step. While Brave Strike will do less damage than Sigmarite Grand Hammer of Oberyn standing him by himself, he'll do one more dice. And that is one more dice because it's adding one to a plural pool and have a better chance of knocking Magor off that objective marker. Magor is not on the objective marker. This 
This is the descriptive text error I came up with previously when playing this tutorial. Select Oberon. Brave Strike. We're gonna bash him. Hopefully. Ooh, a hammer, a single, and a dagger. There's no way he's a dodge defender with that armor. Uh, we'll knock him back to here. And we'll pass for pass then. Which means they've scored Rivers of Blood. With every fighter taking at least some damage, Magor's Fiends are able to score River of Blood. It's a shame that mousing over the underlined River of Blood here won't give us a, a card preview. Zarkus get a little more gets a little more dangerous with plus one damage to all his attacks thanks to great strength. Oh, he's really dangerous then. You have only one objective to score this round, which would be Scores me if you want to take two or more fighters of action this phase. Uh, I don't think we have. Score this a third end phase? No. If you hold objective three Gotta be awe inspiring. Oh. Where is objective free? Oh, it's there. Yeah, okay. You can choose to discard or keep any unscored objectives still in your hand. Drag the objectives onto a player to discard them or click past to keep whatever is left in your hand. Um, odds of taking two enemies out. Magor is a long way away, we might not be able to reach him depending on where he goes. Um, Zarkus has plus one damage, he's likely to take out Angharad, to be honest. Um, what is his damage? Oh, we can't see it, okay. So yeah, I'm going to actually ditch both of these. Oh, I am not, I, I am not. Wait, we've discarded seven objective cards. Yeah, okay, make that eight. There'll be four left in the deck, so we will get our full hand of three. Uh, if you unspent glory, on the upgrades, uh, block. Yes. Yes, absolutely, yes. It's for Angharad. An action to put her and everyone else around her on guard. Yes, please. Yes, we want to do that right now. It has to go on her. And now we have our new cards for the new round. Now that you've learned about using ploys, upgrades and objectives, finish round three. I just get to play this last round. We are seven glory to five, so we're ahead. Let's see who wins the initiative roll. They do, they got a more, more critical hits than we did. Which means they are sadly probably going to go first. Okay. Ha! We defend! But he has swapped us. Well then. Um, let's see. Enemy fighters, no, that's a defensive one. The first attack action, the next activation gains cleave. I'm actually not going to do that. Stormforge resistance, friendly fighters can be driven back by the first. It's our activation next, so... Heroic guard would be great, but no, I'm just passing to the activation. Pass to activation. I shouldn't have to keep clicking multiple passes because you only get... Right, Angharad, I want you to use your block upgrade to put yourself and Severin on guard. And now that we're going to be attacked by Zarkus, probably, because he's the only one who hasn't charged, um, Friendly fighters cannot be driven back, so that Severin will hopefully survive and offer support to one of my own fighters. Uh, roll one extra attack. Yeah, okay, so they're going in heavy on this one. 
Um, uh, yep, that's all good. Right. They have a second healing potion. You're not allowed to have duplicate cards in the deck, so that is clearly for your tutorial purposes only. Right. Um, so... How far does Oberyn move? Oh, we're, we're still... No, no, we're on activations. Why can't I... Uh, pass to power. Who's... No, it's definitely my turn. Uh, I want to have an activation. I want to smack someone. Okay, fine. Ah, there's my activation. Right. Uh, it's risky to have Harold rush in. He can't... Yes, we'll do it. Uh, Sigma right, Great Hammer. We're coming down here. For Zarkus. Two hammers. Oh, and a critical! Damn it! And now he's going to have his counter attack. Oh, hell. That is. Woohoo! <laughs> Two crits and defense is insane! Oberyn, you beast! Right, it's their activation next. Uh, so, we want to put Oberyn on guard. Now, bring it on, chaos scum. Yeah, all right, okay, free hammers. We're going to need a critical to survive that. Hey-oh! Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> all right, and now we're going to go to the activation. And this is going to get risky. Um, and Harad has... I should, I should stop. I should cancel that and look at my objectives. Hold objective two. One... Five, two, four, three. Yeah, three. Okay. Denial. No enemy fighters in your territory. I'll probably get that. So territory. The board is made up of two boards. These green hexes in the middle are no man's land. Everything this side is mine. Everything that side is my opponent's. Annihilation. If all enemy fighters have been taken out of action, well, we're not going to get that. Actually, we might. Uh, but to get Mago would be really tricky. Um, we, we should have probably walked over and up and not charged and then like laid into Mago. Let's see. Um, two damage, one damage, but we've not back on it or something. Whereas you have Lightning Blade for one damage only. Mighty swing or just enemies uh, free damage. Okay, we're gonna do it this way. Uh, Sigmarite broadsword into wait, 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 and then we ch which activation is this? Activation free? Yes, this is gonna be activation free. Okay, uh, in that case, we're coming in from this angle, hoping to knock him back. Critical and two hammers. I was going for the double successes, but hey, and we'll drive him back to there. Uh, enemy fighters can be split. No. I'll save these two for my fourth activation. Oh, oh, that's... We may have lost Oberyn there. We have indeed. That's a critical hit. Unless that's somehow only two damage, he is gone. All right. Uh, enemy fighters can be support... Uh, They've had their last activation. We want our first attack to have cleave, so they can't use shields, and no support. Not that objective three matters too much, but 
pass to activation and we'll send in Severin uh, wait can we mighty swing yes we can good so we charge in attack Zarkus first hope he doesn't counter attack and kill us uh, yep go on double hammers he can't have assists and then we'll cleave on round to Magor who what okay that was a bug but I'll be reporting somehow oh it it automatically knocked him back into oh cuz it's he can still do it when he's dead and now that he's knocked us back we can't get our second attack on Magor which means unfortunately that's going to be the end of the round and of the match actually we got to Nile it's not just a river in Egypt uh, nothing else and we win the tutorial comfortably but hey it's a tutorial and there you have it that's the basics of playing Warhammer Underworlds online. Now, each faction has their own style. Sigmarite's uh, Steelheart's champions are tough stalwart defenders. Magor's fiends are an aggressive attacking force with some, like that counter attack is vicious. They, they, they have a, a vicious, nasty, dirty fighting sort of theme. The orcs, they're big, they're rough, they're tough, they mean business. And the skeletons are slow but also manipulative and are all kind of about board control and doing funky interesting things. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed this video. Uh, the game will be coming out on Early Access on the 28th of January unless I've been misinformed on the date. And I'll hope to have some more videos for you in the next few days tell you what if you like the look of one of these factions why don't you let me know which one you'd like me to play first and I'll go record some games for that tomorrow night or the next night or something in the meantime I'll say bye bye for now and cheerio